Welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to discuss the disease called influenza, which is more commonly just referred to as the flu. So, let me begin this video by giving you a one-line summary of what influenza or the flu is, and then I'll go over the summary of the different topics that we're going to discuss in the video and the order that we're going to go through them in. So, Influenza, in a single line, is a highly contagious viral infection of the respiratory system. So let's just break that down a little bit. Highly contagious means that it's going to be spread from one human to another human extremely easily, and indeed it's spread by the infected human coughing and sneezing, and then um, spreading the virus particle into the air, and the other uninfected human breathing those virus particles in. So it's a highly contagious viral infection. That means that the agent that causes the disease is a virus as opposed to a bacterium or a fungus or some horrible parasite. And then it's a viral infection of the respiratory system. So it's going to infect the cells of the respiratory tract. And so uh, single line summary over. Let's now go on to the outline for the topics that we're going to discuss in this video. So we will begin the video with the clinical bits, which are the symptoms of the illness. What are the symptoms of influenza? So we'll go over the local symptoms of influenza and the systemic symptoms of influenza. At that point, I will contrast influenza, the flu, to the common cold, because it's a common thing that people are confused about. What's the difference between a cold and flu clinically? So we'll start that. Um, well, we'll start with that. Uh, after that, we'll go over a little bit of background knowledge that is necessary for our later discussion of the pathogenesis of influenza. Namely, we'll start off with a bit of anatomy about the respiratory tract and, a bit more advanced, the histology of the epithelial linings of the different parts of the respiratory tract. Now, why do I want to go into that in so much detail? Well, Different portions of the respiratory tract are lined by different types of epithelium and some of these types are susceptible to infection by influenza viruses and some are not. And it's important therefore for us to understand which portions are actually capable of being infected by the influenza virus and which epithelia are not going to be infected by the influenza virus. So we'll go over this histology about the different epithelial linings along the respiratory tract. After that, a bit more background information, we'll go over some terminology with regards to respiratory tract infections. We'll go over things like what's the difference between an upper and lower respiratory tract infection and much more terminology as well. After that, the background will be finished and we'll go on to the bulk of the video and we'll begin the bulk of the video by discussing the influenza viruses. So there are three different species of influenza virus, influenza A virus, influenza B virus and influenza C virus. And they all have slightly, very slightly different structures. Uh, so at that point, we'll discuss the different structures. After that, we'll talk about the pathogenesis of influenza. So we'll discuss transmission, infection of cells, the replication cycle of the influenza viruses within the cells. After that, we'll discuss inflammation. So when you have this viral infection, it triggers the inflammatory response. And the inflammatory response gives rise to most of the symptoms of the illness. So both the local symptoms and the systemic symptoms of the illness that we're just about to go through uh, in the first part of the video. Um, after we've discussed the inflammation that you can get, uh, we'll at that point also discuss the difference between a cold and flu again uh, in terms of the pathogenesis. Uh, and after that, we'll discuss a key complication that can result because of having the flu, which is that you can get pneumonia, which is a very, very serious infection. And there are two different types of pneumonia that you can get as a result of influenza. Primary viral pneumonia, which is thankfully extremely rare, and then what's far more common, which is secondary bacterial pneumonia. So we'll go over the different types of bacteria that can cause secondary bacterial uh, pneumonia after influenza. After we've discussed pneumonia, we'll then talk about the adaptive immune response to the influenza viral infection. So the innate immune system 
through the inflammatory response, does its best to try and clear the viral infection, but it fails, uh, usually, and requires the adaptive immune response to actually bust the um, flu viruses from the respiratory tract. Uh, so we'll go over the adaptive immune response. It's a brilliant opportunity to revise immunology because in response to influenza, you get both a B cell response and a cytotoxic T lymphocyte response. So the two major arms of the adaptive immune response we'll be able to uh, revise in this video. So after the immunology, we'll discuss antigenic drift and antigenic shift in influenza viruses, which is a complicated but extremely important to understand topic and which gives us the explanation as to why you do not just get flu once in your life and then you're immune to it. You get flu multiple different times in your life. Why? Because of antigenic drift and antigenic shift. So we'll discuss uh, those topics. After that, we'll discuss vaccinations to influenza and uh, finally, we'll end the video by discussing treatment of influenza. Now, there are antiviral drugs against influenza. They're not very often actually used because most people will get better from influenza on their own and the benefits that they will get from taking one of the antiviral drugs do not outweigh the risk of side effects from these drugs. So the antiviral drugs, although they do work and they do help get rid of the influenza infection, we only give them to people who are not going to get better from flu on their own. So elderly people where the immune response is weaker uh, who are showing signs of not going getting better from the influenza, we will give antiviral drugs to. Or indeed people with a severe illness like HIV, um, who again have a weak immune response, or if you're taking uh, immunosuppressive medications or chemotherapy, which can weaken the immune system as well. Um, all of these sort of scenarios would mean that potentially the immune response isn't going to be able to get rid of the influenza virus on its own and in those situations at the antiviral drugs will be given but in other situations they're not prescribed. But we'll discuss their mechanisms of action which are extremely interesting and then uh, to complete the treatment we'll talk about uh, symptomatic relief which is what most people should be using when they get the flu, uh, which is paracetamol, aspirin and ibuprofen, which relieve the symptoms but don't actually help get rid of the flu virus. Um, so we'll talk about how uh, paracetamol, aspirin and ibuprofen have antipyretic effects and uh, analgesic effects as well. Okay, so let's begin the video then. So what was the first thing on the list of topics that we're going to go through? Ah yes, it was symptoms of influenza, so the clinical bit. Now this, I always find this a boring part of the video because I'm just listing symptoms at this point and not really explaining why you get all of these symptoms. But I promise you that in later portions of the video we will justify where every single one of these symptoms comes from in the discussion of the pathogenesis. But at this point it is just going to be a list of symptoms. So I apologise if you find this bit boring, I do. So, symptoms then. We divide the symptoms of the flu into two categories, the local symptoms and the global symptoms. So I'll just write this down. So, symptoms is going to be divided into two categories. Category number one is going to be the local symptoms, and category number two is going to be the global, also called the systemic, or in fact more commonly called the systemic symptoms. Okay, so it's very simple. The local symptoms are the symptoms that you get in the local area of the body that is actually infected with the influenza virus, which is the respiratory system. And this is actually a key point here. People describe influenza or the flu as a systemic disease or as a systemic illness. It's not strictly speaking true. People say it, but it's not actually true. A systemic illness is when you actually have the, well, it would be if you actually had the virus going everywhere in the body, infecting all the different tissues of the body. Flu does not cause that, at least it should not cause that. If you have a systemic flu infection, you will die very shortly. Flu is usually a local infection of the respiratory system that causes systemic symptoms. It causes whole body symptoms, but it is not infecting the whole body in most cases. So 
you will hear flu called a systemic illness, but really it's a local illness with systemic symptoms. And the systemic symptoms are there because it's the whole body's response to having a local pathogenic infection. So the whole body responds to the local infection by producing whole body symptoms, and we'll go over what those whole body symptoms are in just a moment, but it does not mean that the infection is actually whole body. So be warned about that terminology. As I say, you will hear it described as a systemic illness, but it isn't really a systemic illness. It's a local illness with systemic symptoms. Okay, so let's now go over some of these symptoms. So we'll start off with category number one, local symptoms. So these are respiratory symptoms. It's the respiratory system that's going to be infected in influenza. So the local symptoms are going to be symptoms pertaining to the respiratory system. So there are six that I'm going to give you. So we'll have the numbered again, number one. And I'll sort of work my way down the respiratory tract. Now I know we're going to go over the anatomy of the respiratory tract later on and we haven't done that yet, uh, but using your basic knowledge of anatomy will work our way down the respiratory tract and if you need clarification of that later on we'll have it in the background section. Okay so starting then with the nasal cavity, the start of the respiratory tract if you like, the, resp the nasal cavity is often infected in influenza. In fact, nearly always it's infected in influenza. So we'll start with symptoms that are going to result in the nasal cavity. And the first one that I'm going to give you is a runny nose. So there is a fancy word for a runny nose, which I'm now in the process of writing down, making sure that I spell it correctly. And this fancy word is rhinorrhea. It means uh, runniness of the nose. So rhine, whenever you see that, it's a prefix that means pertaining to the nose. And rhea means runny. So remember, diarrhea means runny poo. Rhinorrhea means a runny nose. Now, this is the British English spelling of this word, where you have the silly silent O there. In the American English spelling of this word, you would not have the silly O. I... Because I am British, I use these silent O's in all sorts of words. Uh, I agree it's stupid. Um, if you prefer the American English spelling, as most people will, just get rid of the O there and have a slightly easier to remember spelling of this word. So rhinorrhea is the fancy word for a runny nose. That's one of the symptoms, and that's certainly a local symptom. Symptom number two, we're still in the nasal cavity. Oh, and by the way, why is rhinorrhea going to occur? It's because when you get the influenza infection in the nasal cavity, you increase mucus production there and therefore you get the runny nose. Another consequence of having more mucus in the nasal cavity is that the nasal cavity becomes congested. It becomes blocked by the mucus and that can make it difficult to breathe and it can mean that you end up breathing through your mouth rather than your nose. Okay, and that symptom is called nasal congestion. So symptom number two is nasal congestion congestion. And we've all had that before uh, when we've had flu or even a cold which causes very similar local symptoms. Um, that feeling that your nose is blocked, that's what we mean by nasal congestion. Third symptom is still a nasal symptom. When you get a blocked nose, how does the body respond to that? The body does not like having a blocked nose, so it responds to try and clear the blocked nose and that response is sneezing. Sneezing is expulsion of air from the lungs that is aiming to clear the nasal cavity. It's different to coughing. Coughing is another symptom that's going to be lower down on this list, which is trying to clear the respiratory airways. Sneezing is an effort to try and clear the nasal cavity. So sneezing is the third symptom, third local symptom of influenza. Okay, so I've finished with nasal symptoms now, and I'll change colour because we're moving down. Let's now go into the next bit down in the respiratory tract, which hopefully your anatomy is good enough. It's the pharynx after that. After the nasal cavity, you have the pharynx. Don't worry, we will go over this to utterly clarify it when we come on to the background. Um, but you don't really need to know the anatomy at this point just to go over the symptoms. Um, so... Symptoms that are going to ha occur in the pharynx, you're going to get a sore throat. So remember, the pharynx is just the fancy word for the throat. So you get a sore throat. And we, 
again, we've all had a sore throat, and there are some nastier causes of sore throat, such as strep throat, but often a sore throat is caused by a viral infection, either flu or a cold. So a sore throat is uh, a problem in the pharynx and also a problem in the voice box, the larynx. Uh, when we say we've got a sore throat, we're not really distinguishing between the pharynx and the larynx. Pain in that sort of region we describe as a sore throat. We don't say a sore voice box. We say a sore throat if our voice box is hurting. Okay, now coming down again to the voice box. So the sore throat kind of covers both the pharynx and the larynx. Now a symptom it is going to result because of infection and inflammation of the larynx, the voice box specifically, you lose your voice, you get a hoarse voice, your voice changes. So another symptom, hoarse voice. And I said I've got six symptoms, so we're nearly at the end now. Um, local symptoms, we've done nasal, we've done pharynx, we've done larynx. Now, the infection does get lower, I'm afraid, than the larynx usually. It goes into the trachea and the early bronchi usually, the early airways. And when it infects those regions, of course, that's going to result in increased mucus production down there. And you're going to have to try and clear that mucus, just like you had to try and clear it in the nasal cavity, and that's going to produce coughing. So what colour should I have? I'll go to white, I think. So Symptom number six, which is now lower in the respiratory tract, is that you're going to get coughing. And this is again to try and clear mucus, but this time much lower in the respiratory tract than for sneezing. Okay, so there we go. There are the six normal local symptoms of flu. You might get a little bit short of breath, hopefully not in flu. Shortness of breath is more a symptom when it's gone right down to the alveoli and you've got pneumonia. Uh, but because of the increased mucus production in the airways, it can hinder airflow through the airways and therefore you might get a little bit uh, shortness of breath, a little bit difficulty in breathing, but not severe, not to the point that you'd uh, get into a panic and call 999 or whatever the uh, equivalent number is in other countries for an ambulance. Okay, so those are the local symptoms of influenza. Let's now go on to the systemic symptoms. So these are the whole body symptoms that you get with the disease, but again I'll stress the point it is not a systemic infection, it's a local infection of the respiratory system with a whole body response that produces whole body symptoms, but the virus is not in your blood, it's not anywhere else apart from the respiratory system. Okay, so, systemic symptoms then. So, often a response to a horrible infection is to raise core body temperature, and we call this a fever, so that's going to be my number one symptom here. So fever. And also I've got some related symptoms to fever and we'll do all of these in green. So let me just work out how many systemic symptoms I have. Uh, I think I have seven of these if I've counted right. It might be slightly more but seven I think is the number I have. Yes, seven. So the first one on here is that you raised core body temperature. Now what's the normal range for core body temperature to be? The normal range for core body temperature is between 36.5 and 37.5 degrees Celsius. So normally our body temperature is kept in this range. Now, when you get a horrible infection, even if it isn't a systemic infection, if it's just a local infection in the respiratory system, such as flu, the body's response to that is to raise core body temperature. Now, the question, of course, is why? Well, the idea behind it is that when you raise core body temperature, it means that the pathogen is going to have a harder time living in these higher temperatures. So these temperatures higher than 37.5, the idea is that the pathogen won't be able to survive at those higher temperatures and uh, therefore it will help in destroying the pathogenic infection. So the fever is trying to help stop the local infection basically. So, some associated symptoms then with a raised body temperature are that you can get shivers and chills and even what are called rigors. So, let me put these down. So, next is chills. So, chills, again, 
if, to have these, you will have had to have flu. These are not a symptom of colds. And I will actually just talk now a little bit about um, the difference between flu and cold um, clinically. So both flu and colds would be summarised in the same way um, with my one-line summary. Remember, my one-line summary of the flu was it's a highly contagious viral infection of the respiratory system. That one-line summary applies equally well to colds. I will just put cold here. So let's just contrast flu versus cold. So they're both respiratory tract infections by viruses that are both extremely contagious. However, the difference between flu and cold is that they are caused firstly by different viruses. So influenza is caused by influenza viruses, whereas cold, uh, colds are caused by rhinoviruses and coronaviruses. And I'll write down their names later on. You can learn the spellings of those later on when we talk more about this later, much later. But they're both caused by viruses, different viruses, and they actually infect the same portions of the respiratory tract. Therefore, they both cause the same local symptoms. All of these symptoms are exactly the same for flu versus a cold. They both have these same local symptoms, but flu has much more severe systemic symptoms. You get a much more severe fever and you get chills, which you don't usually get in a cold. So what are chills? Chills are where you feel extremely cold. And this is because your body now wants you to be at this higher temperature. So when your body decides that it wants to elevate its temperature from this normal range up to some silly number in order to try and destroy the virus or whatever other infection you have at that time, initially you then feel extremely cold until your body has got up to that new high temperature. And that is called chills. So those sort of shaking, shivering, really cold feelings that you can get when you have a really horrible um, influenza infection, uh, those are chills and you don't usually get those in a cold. Uh, so they're a symptom really of flu. And then even more severe than chills, you can then get rigors. Now rigors describe extreme shaking whilst feeling extremely cold. So they're a more extreme example of chills. They're chills with shaking. So chills will often be accompanied with shivering. So I'll put this on, chills and shivering. And of course, shivering is to try and raise your body temperature. The idea is that you're using your muscles and that some of the energy will be expended as will, will be used to create heat and that that will raise core body temperature. So, uh, chills are often accompanied with shivering. When the shivering gets to a point where it's actually more than shivering, it's shaking, that's called a rigor. So a rigor is feeling extremely cold, the chills, with really severe shivering to the point that you describe it as shaking rather than shivering. So again, these are not a symptom of a cold. These are a symptom of flu. Uh, they're a severe systemic symptom of uh, an infective illness. So um, these are symptoms that are going to be much, much worse in flu versus cold. In fact, all of the systemic symptoms, they're going to be much, much worse in flu versus a cold. That's the clinical difference. In a cold, you do not get severe systemic symptoms. You might get them to a little bit. You might get a little bit of a raised temperature, but you won't get chills and shivering and rigors in a cold. Whereas in flu, you will. Well, you might. Um, you, certainly you'll get chills and shivering. Hopefully you won't get rigors unless you're very, very unwell. Okay, uh, so let's continue on the systemic symptoms of flu then. And I want a new colour now. So, um, another systemic symptom then. Symptom number four is that you end up feeling extremely tired, which we call fatigue. And... This is a symptom that you will get in both flu and a cold, but in a cold, it's not that bad. Whereas in a flu, in, if you've got flu, it's much, much worse. Um, so often the way that you can distinguish between a cold and a flu is that if you are well enough still to go to work, even though you've got these local symptoms, you might have a cough, you might be sneezing, you might feel nasally congested and have a sore throat, a hoarse voice maybe and a runny nose, even though you've got those, but you still feel well enough to go to work and do your normal stuff, you might feel a little bit subnormal, you know, not as well as you usually feel, then it's a cold. If 
you are bed bound. You literally cannot go to work. You're feeling absolutely terrible, as though you're going to die. Uh, extremely exhausted. Then you've got flu. So the systemic symptoms are much, much worse in flu compared to a cold. That's the difference. And they're caused by different viral infections of the respiratory system. So fatigue is a severe symptom of um, influenza. And that's major. I've recently actually had flu, which makes it very easy for me to describe these symptoms. And I really, really was exhausted. Um, I couldn't go to work. I couldn't go to the hospital. I shouldn't have gone to the hospital, of course, because um, I didn't, shouldn't be giving this to uh, patients in the hospital. Um, but I didn't want to. I was extremely, extremely tired. So fatigue can be terrible in flu. Okay, um, then um, continuing on with the systemic symptoms then, and once another colour, we're going to have to go back. Oh, actually, I'll find some more interesting colours. We'll do orange. So, Fifth systemic symptom of flu, then. Uh, appetite loss is another symptom that you get with influenza. Again, this is a symptom that you won't really get if you've got a cold, but you do get if you've got flu. It's a systemic symptom. So let's just justify why you get fatigue and appetite loss as systemic symptoms of influenza. When you've got a horrible infection like influenza in the respiratory tract, the body needs to get better, and for the body to get better, it really just needs to rest. It needs to lie in its in bed and not go out and do things, so that it can just concentrate on getting better rather than concentrating on other things. That is why you become really tired when you've got a horrible infection, so that you so that your brain won't try to actually make the body do things. Instead, you'll just lie around and rest. And of course, if you're going to just lie around and rest, you have to lose your appetite as well, because if you're hungry, then you'll have to get up, you'll have to go and find food. Uh, so these two things go together, really. You, if you want to just rest, you can't just make yourself extremely tired. You also need to destroy the appetite, otherwise you're going to have to get up to find food. So appetite and fatigue are both about trying to stop the brain make the body do things and instead make the brain just rest the body so that the body can concentrate on getting better. So those two kind of go together. I wish I put them in the same colour. The final two symptoms, six and seven, will definitely be in the same colour because their mechanism is actually believed to be very similar. So let's do them in this yellow colour. So six. S the sixth symptom is that you're going to often get a headache with flu which is a generalised headache, so it's all over the place. So it's not just on one side or specifically behind the eye or anything like that, like a migraine would be. Uh, it's generalised headache all over the place. Okay, uh, and symptom seven is that you get muscle aches. Now, why have I linked these two together? Well, they're both pain in areas far, far away from the respiratory system. This one is pain up in the head, and this one is pain in muscle aches all over the body, by the way. These are, you know, muscles in the arms, you'll get pain there, you'll get pain in the legs. And again, think back to the last time you've had flu, when you've been really, really ill with a respiratory tract infection that has meant that you could not go to school or could not go to work or could not do what you normally do and just were bed bound instead. You will probably remember that you had a severe headache and also aches in your legs and your arms and those aches are deep and they're in the muscles. Now again these are systemic symptoms but they do not mean that the virus has gone to the head or that it is in the muscles. The virus is not in these places. Instead these are caused by the large amount of immune proteins immune hormones, hormones of the immune system, inflammatory mediators that have been released at the site of infection, the respiratory tract, that have gone into the blood and are now causing symptoms in far off places as though there was an infection there, but there isn't. So these symptoms, we will discuss the mechanism that is believed to underlie them more later on, but the key thing that I want to put across at this point is that they do not mean that the virus is now infecting some part of your brain or um, your muscles. They are systemic symptoms, but it is not a systemic illness. 
Okay, so there we go, there. I have completed my two lists of these two categories of symptoms of flu, and I want to go over this argument one final time. Flu versus cold, what is the difference? Both of them are highly contagious viral infections of the respiratory tract, and they infect the same portions of the respiratory tract, and therefore they cause these same local symptoms. So both of them cause these same local symptoms. If you get these sort of symptoms, a cough and a sneeze and all of this, um, but you are well enough to go to work or go to school, i.e. you still feel okay, you might feel a little bit more tired, you might have a slight fever, maybe a slight headache, um, but you still feel okay, then that is most likely a cold. If you are so unwell, so tired, feeling like you're going to die, and all you want to do, all you're capable of doing is lying in bed, that is the flu. And you will in your life have had both colds and flu, which it means that this is a nice disorder, oh, sorry, nice disease, because we can all understand it, because we've all had it. In flu, you get these symptoms, the systemic symptoms, much, much worse than you get with a cold. You get horrendous tiredness, and with it, appetite loss, fever, and chills, which result in shivering. If you're really, really unwell, you might even get rigors, but I, when I have recently had flu, I don't think I had rigors. Uh, and you also get these horrible headaches and horrible muscle aches all over the body. And we will, later on, when we discuss the pathogenesis of influenza, we will justify where every single one of these symptoms comes from. So at the moment, I know it is just a list of symptoms, but if you follow this video until the end, you will have an exact explanation of where all of these come from, a satisfactory explanation. Okay, we will have a break here. In the next video, we'll start our background knowledge. We'll start with the anatomy of the respiratory tract, which will help people who weren't completely sure of how I was working down the respiratory tract here. Uh, and then we'll talk about the epithelial linings of different portions of the respiratory tract.